Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, and welcome to this week's uh, webinar uh, and uh, series, Echo Diabetes in the Time of COVID-19. I'm Dr. Nick Kutcheris, Program Director, Pediatric Endocrinologist at Stanford University and co-founder of IUDA. We're grateful for the unrestricted educational grants that were received from Novo Nordis and Pfizer Inc. that makes this program possible. Our goal is to address the urgent needs of patients with type 1 and type 2 diabetes who require complex diabetes treatment in the time of COVID-19 and beyond. We want to empower primary care providers and clinics to safely and effectively manage underserved patients who do not have access to routine specialty diabetes care. Even before COVID-19 uh, pandemic, outcomes for patients with diabetes were suboptimal. Data from over 190 million uh, patients enrolled in health plans that report HEDIS results to the National Committee on Quality Insurance illustrate system failure for patients with diabetes. In 2018, less than one third of patients with type 1 and type 2 diabetes received a target A1C values of an A1C of 7% or less. Even more concerning, 30 to 40 percent of patients had A1C values greater than 9 percent. We must recognize that these outcomes do not reflect, reflect patient non-compliance, but rather system failure. Minimizing hyperglycemia is paramount to reducing diabetes patient risks and vulnerability to infection and complications, and particularly in COVID-19. Now is an opportune time to overcome therapeutic inertia and make meaningful system changes so that patients are able to achieve glycemic targets. We are living in unprecedented times with COVID-19, but systemic racism and health inequalities have been endemic to the U.S. COVID-19 is making these injustices more clear. We must come together as a medical community and change our practice. We must act. When the mortality rate from COVID-19 in Black Americans is at least two times, if not five times, as high as the mortality for whites, we must act. When marked racial disparities in diabetes management exist, and prior to that of COVID-19, we must act. When Black Americans with diabetes with equivalent socioeconomic status as white Americans are less likely to be prescribed intensive insulin management regimens and diabetes technology proven to improve diabetes outcomes, we must act. We must act and recognize systemic racism and implicit biases that are also occurring within our medical community and practice today. Our leadership team and faculty are committed to promoting health equity through our program and combating systemic racism in the U.S. We are committed to action. Here at Stanford, we're partnering with Project ECHO and other sites across the U.S. on this series. Project ECHO is a globally recognized hub and spoke outreach model developed at the University of New Mexico to reduce disparities and improve health outcomes in patients who otherwise lack routine specialty care. Our presentation agenda will be responding to questions from last week's session, a lecture followed by a submitted case presentation from the community, and we'll then address some of the pre-submitted questions our audience members submitted during registration. Please use the Q&A feature in the Zoom to submit questions specific to the topic or presentation. The chat box can be used for communication amongst attendees and sharing best practices and resources. We'll try our best to address all of your questions submitted through the registration and chat. However, if we are unable to get your questions today, please do register for a future session and submit, submit your question again. The webinar is being recorded and the lecture portion of this webinar will be available in a few weeks on our website on the on-demand webinar se section. The case presentation from today will not be included on the web on-demand webinar. Our web development team is working to build a, a resource library on COVID-19 uh, where the session materials will be found. After the webinar ends, you'll be emailed an evaluation that will enable you to claim continuing education credit. We have an exciting series yet to come with excellent and relevant topics. As a reminder, you and other learners are welcome to drop in for one session or more. We are fortunate to have a national faculty from over 12 ECHO programs and organizations around the country. I'm going to now stop sharing my screen and uh, introduce our um, faculty and our staff for this program. Um, going by state, um, um, we'll start uh, with California. Once again, I'm Dr. Nick Cutris, pediatric endocrinologist and, and director of this program at Stanford University. Uh, Linda? 
Hi, I'm Linda Baer, and I'm the Director of Education for this series, and I've also had type 1 diabetes for 49 years. Welcome. Marissa. Hi, I'm Marissa Town, and I'm a nurse and diabetes educator, and I've lived with type 1 diabetes for 30 years. Christine. Hi, I'm Christine. I'm the project coordinator. And moving on to our faculty at Stanford, Marina. Hi, I'm Marina Bassina. I'm adult faculty at Stanford, adult endocrinology. And Magdalena. Hi, I'm Magdalena Ford. I'm a nurse practitioner with Stanford Adult Endocrinology. Uh, Corey. Hi there. Um, my name is Corey Hood. I'm a psychologist and a professor at Stanford University. Jesse. Hi, I'm Jesse Wong, and I'm a diabetes psychologist at Stanford University. Rehan. Hey there, guys. I'm Rehan. I've had type 1 for 30 years. I'm an adult and pediatric endocrinologist at Stanford. And also in California, Jay. Hi, everybody. Welcome aboard. Jay Schubert, primary care diabetologist at Torrey University, of California. And moving down to Florida, Eleni. Oh, she's not on today. Um, Ashby. Hi, everyone. I'm Ashby Walker. I'm a medical sociologist. I'm in the College of Public Health at the University of Florida. I'm the director for health equity initiatives here. And in the early morning, aloha, Dan. Good morning. Uh, I'm Dan Saltman. I'm an associate clinical professor at the University of Hawaii and a primary care internist. I spent most of my career in, um, in community, working in community health centers. And to Iowa, Dave. Hi, my name's Dave Faldmo. I'm a physician assistant at the Siouxland Community Health Center and also serve as the quality director and uh, lead our ECHO project here and uh, work a lot with our social determinants of health. And down to Louisiana, Dragana. Hi, everybody. I'm Dragana Lovre. I'm an adult endocrinologist at Tulane University in New Orleans, Louisiana. And to Maine, Erwin. Hi, I'm Erwin Brodsky. I'm um, an adult endocrinologist at the Endocrinology Diabetes Center of Maine Medical Center and adjunct scientist at the Maine Medical Center Research Institute. And to uh, New Jersey, Mary. Hi everyone, I'm Mary Bridgman. I'm a clinical professor at the School of Pharmacy at Rutgers University and an internal medicine clinical pharmacist at Robert Wood Johnson University Hospital in New Brunswick. Welcome. And to the Echo Institute in New Mexico, Matt. Hi, I'm Matt Bishamville. I'm an adult endocrinologist at the University of New Mexico. And to New York, Marissa. Hi, I'm an adult endocrinologist at SUNY Upstate Medical University in Syracuse, New York. And um, uh, back to California, Kelly, you want to introduce yourself? Yeah, hello, my name is Kelly Close, and I'm editor at diatribe.org. I have had diabetes for almost 35 years, and I'm privileged to be a patient representative on the faculty. Great, thank you all. And, um, so in follow-up to uh, last week's session um, uh, and kind of high impact follow-up questions, there was lots of chat and question regarding um, uh, dexamethasone and should dexamethasone be given to patients with diabetes and COVID-19. So just want to take a few minutes um, to, uh, to review um, this question and, and why is there all this talk about dexamethasone and, and COVID um, so far. So preliminary and un unpublished um, uh, findings from the recovery uh, uh, study, which is a UK uh, study sponsored by their um, NHS. It was a, random, uh, a randomized uh, controlled trial of hospitalized patients with COVID-19. Uh, they were randomized to multiple arms of the standard care plus the arm um, compared to just standard care alone. And one of the study arms included dexamethasone, where patients were given um, six milligrams, either IV or PO for 10 days or until hospital discharge. And their endpoint was mortality rate after 28 days. 
Um, and um, uh, there was a, um, uh, a release, a press release that went out um, uh, the other week, and the study was halted due to survival benefit. Um, and it showed that there was a uh, decreased mortality rates when dexamethasone was given in the arm who required supplemental oxygen um, and also mechanical ventilation. However, there is no difference in patients who did not require supplemental oxygen who received dexamethasone. Um, and in the preliminary results, the di there was uh, there's no reporting of diabetes subset and, and mortality uh, in there. Um, so these are just preliminary results. The, 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 all the data has not been released. Um, and there's also uh, limited patients uh, who are enrolled in the pediatric population and, and, and pregnancy. Um, and so this is the, the summary of uh, the results that were, that were published. And as you can see, um, dexamethasone mortality rate decreased by about one third or survival rate improved by one third in patients on mechanical ventilation um, and um, survival rate also in, uh, improved but less significantly in those on supplemental oxygen. Once again, those who required no oxygen, there was no survival benefits from dexamethasone and diabetes subset was not reported in the preliminary results. So we don't know the implica implications of dexamethasone in diabetes. Now, dexamethasone is a glucocorticoid and the half-life can uh, be 36 to 58 hours um, and it's associated with hyperglycemia. Um, and so you add, what we do know is hyperglycemia plus diabetes plus COVID-19 is not a good mix. And there is a well-established increased risk of mortality with patients with hyperglycemia, diabetes, and COVID-19 infection. So even prior to COVID, there is a, you know, we should caution um, of the risk of DK and hyperglycemia in the hospital, as many of you uh, know that can occur. Um, and so that's the same during, during COVID. Um, and so whether we're talking about COVID or non-COVID, there, uh, there, there really needs to be preemptive mitigation of risk of hyperglycemia and DKA if dexamethasone or any other glucocorticoid um, is used in patients with, with, uh, with diabetes. Um, and so patients who are on oral medications, this is when we can consider changing to um, insulin management, considering insulin drip and the need for increased insulin requirements um, when, when patients are on glucocorticoids. Um, we've also heard um, from our um, series um, on sick day management and COVID. I would uh, um, encourage you to uh, go back uh, to that talk where we also talked about holding SGLT2s um, uh, in patients who are hospitals as well and talked about insulin dose adjustments. Um, and I think that's also a, um, a, a great segue to our upcoming um, uh, didactic uh, right now. And so I'm going to take a minute and pause here um, and introduce our uh, speaker um, for today, Dr. Jay Shubrick. Uh, he's a board certified family physician and fellow trained diabetologist. He serves as pr professor in the primary care department at Tarot University, California College of Osteopathic Medicine. He also serves as the director for clinical research and diabetes, director of diabetes service at the, at the institution. His clinical research focus is early intervention and treatment of type 2 diabetes and better training in the primary care workforce to manage chronic disease such as diabetes. He serves on the American Diabetes Association Primary Care Advisory Group and is an associate editor for the Clinical Diabetes and for the Journal of the American Osteopathic Association. He has published more than 100 papers in peer-reviewed journals focused on this interface of diabetes management in the primary care setting. I'm going to pass um, the screen share off to Jay, and thanks again for um, taking the time to give this uh, talk today, Jay. Uh, thank you much. Uh, my screen. Can you all see my screen? Yes. Okay. So thank you much, and I'm happy to be talking today to the group about insulin dosing and, and clinical inertia. This is something that's near and dear to my heart. And for all those out there in primary care, I spend about half of my clinical time in a public health clinic. And this is a conversation we have routinely about how to initiate insulin and how to intensify insulin. Our objectives for today are to discuss the need to assess for insulin dose changes during the time of COVID, to talk about ways to increase confidence 
both in providers and patients in addressing insulin therapy intensification, and then really kind of talk about the practical natures of formulating plans for insulin intensification. Uh, this is some of the barriers I think that we need to be aware of and uh, be attentive to when we're looking at insulin as a treatment. These are no way statements of fact. These are just things that I think you need to know are part of the equation. Many of our patients consider insulin as a sign of failure. Um, so this is something that they see very negatively. Um, insulin can be scary, both for the provider and for the patients. And, you know, in fact, I had this just yesterday. A patient said, well, I didn't take my diabetes seriously until I had to start taking insulin. And so in some respects, it really is a milestone on disease. And then for provider standpoint, sometimes insulin dosing can be uh, complicated and it perceived to be dangerous because of the concern of hypoglycemia. And we all know that insulin is expensive and it is a significant barrier to the use of insulin um, for diabetes. Some kind of messages that I want to highlight, and much of this focus will be on type 2 diabetes, not type 1, um, is that it's important for us to recognize as providers not to use insulin as a weapon. When we weaponize insulin, then it becomes a negative uh, message. A lot of my patients ask, if I start on insulin, does that mean I have to be on it forever? And I think there's some messaging that we could use about the power of insulin and the best placement of insulin. I find that actually insulin is very important to give the first injection in the office so that we can overcome some of the practical barriers. And when we're using insulin, we'll talk a bit about starting a weight-based dose setting a titration scale and a ceiling dose, and remember to utilize your glucose readings to be uh, indicators of uh, success of therapy. And then I think one thing, particularly in primary care, we could do better is always look at injection sites. Sometimes uh, surprises and insulin response doesn't have to do with the insulin itself, but where we're putting it and how we're injecting it. Uh, this is the simplified American Diabetes Association algorithm. I always know that this doesn't look so simple to me, um, but what I want to highlight is that in the top right corner in the box is probably one of the most important messages. To avoid therapeutic inertia, if someone's not achieving goals, we should be titrating and intensifying therapy every three or six months. And so these are not a one and done. When you make a treatment, including when you're using insulin, we need to be using timely intensification. So the ADA does recommend that we intensify every three to six months if we're not at goal. Um, and anyone that's above 10%, according to the ADA, insulin should be considered as one of the treatment uh, of regimens, which means that most people with type two diabetes would be on insulin in one to two years if they were not at goal. And that's certainly not been our clinical experience. Only about 31% of patients ever get their, or get their treatment intensified uh, in, a, in such a manner. And the mean time to insulin is over four years. And that's actually an improvement. It used to be 10 years. So we are doing better, but we have areas where we could improve upon more. And as we've talked about earlier, when we're looking at um, social inequities, we know that African Americans and Latino Americans are even less likely to get insulin when they need it. And so, it is important that we recognize that this is an important tool and it needs to be utilized in a timely manner. Um, this is a, a study that Steve Edelman uh, led that we worked on and we surveyed uh, patients and providers about the start of insulin. And the good news is both patient priority and pa uh, prior provider priorities were the same, trying to maintain or achieve an A1C goal to, to, over time. There were some differences in the other top priorities, but they were all focused on, hey, let's use insulin and get to goal. But despite having that shared priority, um, there was a, a mismatch between the provider and the patient perspective of whether we achieved that goal. So 85% of the providers and only half of that uh, patient said they actually achieved that goal at 12 months. And, and many of the providers felt like the patient would be unwilling to do more, but 93% of those patients said they'd be very willing or somewhat willing to do more to achieve the goal. So patients want to see that goal as an important marker for them. When we look at intensification, these next two slides are busy, it is important to recognize that at, at one year, those patients that were not at goal, the provider said, well, let's give them another six months to get to goal. 
And in fact, 40%, we'd even give them a year to get to gold. This is a very slow and frustrating process for the patients because patients want to get to gold quicker. And then 60% of those patients said that they felt frustrated about not achieving their goals. And frustration was high at the start of insulin. It was actually relatively low in that first three months, but it continued to increase up to a year when, they, when insulin intensification did not result in an achieved goal. So our patients care a lot about when they get an insulin added, they want to see it to work. And when, it was at, when we asked them about kind of the psychosocial aspects, two thirds of the patients felt like not achieving their goal had a negative effect on their emotional well-being, and 40% felt like it had a negative effect on their social and family life. And in fact, that meant that 22% discontinued insulin without consulting their healthcare provider, something that many of us as healthcare providers underestimated the power of. And the main reasons for discontinuing insulin were costs, side effects, often that was weight gain, or not making progress. So I think if we don't intensify basal insulin in a timely manner, we're helping our patients, um, it, well, we're increasing their frustration and we're more likely they're gonna stop that treatment. I only have one or two more slides of bad news and we'll get to the good news. We do know that there's a systematic review of studies showed that only 39% of patients who were started on basal insulin actually achieved the target goal of 7%. And then another real world database showed that about 38% of the patients um, achieved a goal within uh, below 7% uh, at, at 12 months. So patients are not getting the goal. Um, the Dune study, which is led by Menangini, looked at a patient and provider match and said, let's set a goal together. And so the, the, the team had an agreed upon goal, but only 27% of patients actually got to that achieved goal at 12 weeks. And when you looked at how the insulin was titrated, the titration was rather mild. You know, for new users, there was only a nine unit increase in dose. And in continued units, there was only a five unit increase in dose. So part of not achieving the goal was not intensifying um, that target glucose. And then finally, um, again, there was a study showing that if you didn't achieve your target glucose at three months, you are not likely to achieve your target glucose at 24 months. So all of this is really summarized to say that if you're going to start basal insulin, you've got three months to get to that target goal. And, you know, doing that is going to be more efficacious, doing it is evidence-based, and doing it is going to empower and help your patients to feel like it's making a difference. And so I think that when we're looking at the clinical inertia and the power of insulin, I think we really need to focus on basal insulin first, uh, particularly in the primary care setting. So what are my suggestions for best practices in starting basal insulin? First of all, I think it, the first injection of the office is something I mentioned that will say it over and over again. We often talk to our patients about fixing the fasting first. So the first insulin is a basal insulin. Uh, we'll talk about the specifics of a weight-based dose and titration schedule and a ceiling dose, and then reminding them the fast and glucose. And again, this is something, again, to share with patients so they kind of know where we're going. So not many people I know who don't have diabetes think it makes sense that you're going to stab yourself with some sharp object. So it is something that's foreign to much of our experience, and it's often outplayed in how painful or how bad it'll be. So doing the first injection in the office one, will allow the patient to know it's safe to take an injection and go home. Two, that it is less painful than they anticipated. And three, it's, it, particularly with pen devices, it's quite simple. And I think that many patients find that they're much more likely to continue and attrition will be less if they get that first injection in the office. Now, if you have samples, you can do that in the office right at the time of care. But if you don't, because many clinics don't have samples, it's fine to write the prescription ask the patient to fill the prescription and bring them back for that teaching for that first injection. And not every office has a diabetes educator. So if, you know, it might be that your team might be the provider, it could be a diabetes educator, it could be a PharmD, it could be a medical assistant, but find some workflow in your office so that you can provide that first injection in the office. Working with patients, we fix that fasting first. We remind our patients that if we remove glucose toxicity in the morning, you might get a better response from your existing medications later in the day. 
and that we're really going to look at a glucose target goal. So it might be that if I'm just starting basal insulin, my target goal in the morning might be 150, even though that may not correspond to the eventual A1C I want to get to. It'll at least give me a place to start and let the patient see what we're working towards. Now, even though the ADA recommends um, 10 units or 0.1 unit to 0.2 units per kilogram per day, I would suggest that in the primary care setting, we use 0.2 to 0.3 units per kilogram per day as the starting dose. Many patients feel more empowered when they see a response from their medication. And if you take a medicine, particularly something that wasn't desired and they don't see a response right away, they're less likely to continue. Now, if you're, that dose is for a long-acting insulin analog. If you were going to use NPH, you would just take that and divide it into two, typically given before breakfast and before dinner or bedtime, 0.1 unit per kilogram per day. And that math is usually pretty straightforward um, for many of our patients. What are some best practices once you've started that dose? I think we have very good evidence that letting your patient titrate the insulin is more timely and as effective as, as letting the provider do the titration. So I recommend that you could use any of these titration schedules, one unit per day increase, three units twice weekly, or five to seven units once weekly. Pick your titration schedule. In my office, we do our titrations typically, uh, typically on Mondays and Thursdays. And we find that that is, if there's any questions, I'll be in the, the clinic and available to answer questions. So we do three units on every Monday and Thursday as a default for our patients with type two. And so they know that they're gonna to continue to go up. And we know how quickly their insulin dose is going up. Now, I don't know if you've ever experienced this, but my patients, if I tell them, let's do a titration, let's go up three units every Monday and Thursday, they're gonna do one titration and then they're gonna stop. They're not going to continue it because many people are nervous. They're nervous about hypoglycemia. They're worried about taking too much insulin. And what we want to do is give them goals, parameters, to, so which they should continue or not continue the titration. So I usually say, we're going to titrate this insulin until one of three things happens. One, you've achieved your target goal. If that's 150, once you get to 150, don't keep titrating till we talk. Two, if you've had a hypoglycemic episode, which I don't think you're going to happen and have it happen initially, stop and let me know. Don't keep titrating because we want to make sure that this is safe. And then three, we usually use a 0.5 unit per kilogram per dose, or excuse me, per day uh, ceiling, because that allows us to see how much response they've gotten and, and really to give them the message that we're going to watch closely and work with them. So with that in mind, if I know that, I know how many titrations they're going to need before I need to see them again to reassess. And I think I have a case next to kind of show that to you. I'll show you one more slide. Um, when you use basal insulin, the other thing that I think is a real challenge is that we rely on it too heavy. So if we over rely on basal insulin to cover meals, we say that's over basalized. So I often say stop at 0.5 units per kilogram per day, look up, and kind of see what the glucose readings are doing and make sure you're getting the expected response. Make sure your fasting glucose is, is stable and it's not getting too bouncy because if it's bouncing a lot, the patient may be dropping low overnight. We often talk about looking at the beam, bedtime to first AM as, you know, is that a steady decrease or is it a too sharp of a decrease overnight? Your basal insulin is meant to cover you overnight in between meals. So hopefully you're not dropping too much overnight. And then eventually uh, we have found that if you get above 0.7 units per kilogram per day, while insulin has no ceiling effect on dosing um, in terms of efficacy, you get diminishing returns in terms of metabolic side effects and unexpected hypoglycemia. So really I think that in, in the primary care setting, we really shouldn't be titrating above that. And, and we'll get to what to do after basal insulin next. So I have an illustrative case, and I hope that this will kind of highlight some of the things that we're talking about. Roberta has type two diabetes, and she's had it for eight years, and she's had control in the past, but for the last six months, she's really had a change in her lifestyle, and she's found that her A1C has increased to 10.6. She is taking um, metformin and glipizide. Her weight is 100 kilograms, and we discussed her options, and we agreed at this point to start basal insulin, 
this was a shared decision because she said, what's going to get me to control? I, I'm frustrated that I've not had my control. And so this is really um, letting her say this is a powerful option for her. Now, we're going to talk what to do about glipizide later, but let's just say if we were starting basal insulin, I might start at 0.3 units per kilogram per day. And at 100 kilograms, that would be 30 units. I'll reassure her that even though that sounds like a lot of units, that's an effective dose to help get her glucose down. And let's just say we had corresponding fasting glucose readings that were running in the 180 to 200 range. Um, I'm gonna give the first injection in the office. And for her, we talked about options and we're gonna increase by five units every Monday and Thursday. So I know that we're shooting for a fasting glucose below 150, but certainly not below 100. And I want her to call if she has any hypoglycemia. With this titration schedule, because I've given her, you know, the titration uh, schedule, the starting dose and the ceiling dose of 50 units per day, she knows that she'll have four titrations that she's gonna do. Not more than that, so this is not an indefinite titration. So I'm gonna actually schedule a two week follow up to see how she's doing. Patients really need and, and deserve that kind of supportive touch so that they, as they go into this new step, that, that you're doing it with them. And so by doing this, you're going to let her know that we're doing it together. Now, uh, just for the sake of argument, I do think it's important for you to know that um, she is on glipizide, which is a sulfonylurea. When you add insulin, there is the potential for hypoglycemia. For me personally, at 10.6, I'm probably not going to stop glipizide till we get a little closer to home. If I'm about 1 to 1.5 within my target, I might reduce glipizide, but I probably wouldn't stop it. But that's a judgment call. I think some providers would stop it just because they're concerned. Just know you're going to need to use more insulin if you remove the sulfonylurea at the same time you start insulin. So, Let's say we get Roberta on the 0.5 units per kilograms per day, and she doesn't have hypoglycemia. Her fasting glucose is at target, but now she's climbing uh, you know, after meals. And the only way that some patients will know that is you ask them to move their fasting blood sugars, right? Because they might be checking once a day. They were focused on fasting glucose initially, but now we're actually asking them to check no longer in the morning, but move it to later in the day and maybe even sandwich a meal before and after the meal so they can see the glucose excursion with the meal. That's important because then the patients can see how their daily lives affect their diabetes. So we might remind them that, hey, if your glucose climbs with a meal, what are you doing lifestyle behavior wise you know, in terms of carbohydrates? Is that a heavy carbohydrate meal? That's a choice rather than adding another medication. Have you incorporated physical activity after your meals? Another very effective tool to reduce postprandial hyperglycemia. If you're looking at intensifying treatment in the primary care setting, this is again an opinion. I feel like you should be always looking at a GLP-1 before you're looking at mealtime insulin. I feel like there are non-glycemic benefits. In many respects, it can be done safer and it's simpler. If you're going to look at insulin, we have evidence now that a basal plus one injection regimen is as good as a basal bolus regimen in type two diabetes. So you might work with your patient to just add one mealtime injection, and you can discuss whether that's gonna be four units of the biggest meal or 10% of their basal dose, but either way, um, it's one of your options. And now we have other agents that you could add back on as oral agents after insulin as well. So if you're considering injection, I mentioned the GLP-1. We have efficacy data that it's better than mealtime insulin in type 2 diabetes. We have less hypoglycemia. Patients get the benefit of weight loss, which they're concerned about um, because of insulin dosing. And we know that there are non-glycemic benefits, as you've heard earlier, specifically looking at cardiovascular and renal. What are the disadvantages of GLP-1? Well, first, they're expensive. They're all expensive, and you, they, you're going to have to make sure that you have costs addressed as well as coverage. And then certainly you want to be a, a cognizant of the contraindications or warnings of GLP-1s, including pancreatitis, gastroparesis, and the un, rare medullary thyroid cancer. I mentioned that if, if you looked at basal plus one, consider uh, doing one meal a day. Believe it or not, it doesn't matter what meal. You know, I always felt nervous about saying whatever's the biggest meal, because it might be that you don't know what is the biggest meal that day. 
Um, I find that starting with breakfast is, is efficient for people who eat breakfast. Other people, their dinner is by far their biggest meal and that's how they choose. I like personally to use 0.1 unit per kilogram per day. I showed you the other uh, slide where ADA talks about four units uh, per meal or 10% of your basal. And then we have other agents like SGLT2 inhibitors um, or an oral GLP-1 that could be used to help do mealtime coverage after you've got the fasting glucose down. Again, you have to decide, is that something that you can get covered? Is it something that's not too costly? But it is an option to bring back in. And many patients are excited when you can bring back oral agents after you get the fasting glucose down. And never forget the power of behavior change as one of your treatments. Um, and patients feel really excited when they can do something and you don't have to intensify their therapy. So, you know, even though we always get focused on doing it, let your patient be part of the answer. So I think in summary, I wanna cover the following things. In terms of basal, if I were asking primary care to, to intensify insulin, focus on getting our basal insulin right. You got three months from the time you start basal insulin to really have evidence-based efficacy that's going to help the patient and help you achieve goals. Give the first injection in the office, fix the fasting first, start with a weight-based dose, set your titration schedule, give a parameter for stopping titration, including that ceiling dose. Psychologically, that's so important for the patient to know what the stop point is. And then uh, if you're looking at post-basal coverage, uh, it's move your glucose readings to pre and post meals to determine the mealtime need. Don't forget about lifestyle interventions and then make your decision between basal plus one, which is one injection of fast acting insulin, basal plus GLP-1 or basal plus oral. And then if you're looking at an injection, please consider your GLP-1 as your first um, mealtime injection. I have references here for the audience in terms of what is from the ADA. I have some primary care focused readings as it relates to starting and intensifying insulin. And then these are the references uh, from the presentation. Uh, this is our team at Toro University and we have a very vigorous outreach campaign. So this is our MOBIC, Mobile Diabetes Education Center that goes all over the community and provides free blood pressure, glucose, depression, and tobacco cessation screening. And I'm happy to say we just had our three-year anniversary and we've screened more than 6,500 people in Solano County for these conditions. And we do these screenings as an extension of our medical practice. Thank you and I'll take questions. Thank you so much, uh, Jay. We had um, some great um, questions come in and I'm gonna have some of our faculty open it up. I just wanted to comment. Um, there were some questions on um, um, insulin and medication assistance. We have a, um, a handout, a resource sheet. If you go to our uh, main website here um, and under um, diabetes in a time of COVID resources, you click on that. There's um, uh, hyperlinks uh, that will uh, take you to um, uh, additional programs that um, support with uh, medication assistance. Um, one of them referenced there is um, the Diatribe website. They have an excellent um, uh, resource guide on, on COVID. Um, Kelly, I don't know if you have any additional comments on, on that before we move on to other questions. Thank you. We've been able um, to put it together with um, just being able to use all of the learnings of this many of the Stanford faculty. So thank you so much. Yeah, tietribe.org slash COVID-19. Jay, there was one question that came in um, asking about basal insulin. Um, going from, when do you go from one uh, dose to splitting the dose in, into two doses? Yeah, that's a really great question. So for me personally, um, I really try to minimize the number of injections. And so for type two diabetes, if I do a, a, a titration schedule that is expedient, I usually can get it with one daily dose. If I exceed the number of units that a pen can deliver, I might divide the pen then. But the, usually it's for patient comfort and satisfaction, not so much for efficacy in adults with type 2 diabetes. Um, you know, in type 1, there's times where we would divide that dose, but in type 2, it's less frequent. Um, 
And then Jay, you also mentioned, you know, uh, and, and kind of best practices doing the first uh, insulin injection in the office. So now in the time of, of COVID, when that isn't uh, possible, whether uh, Jay, you or other faculty want to kind of comment on tips of other resources being used in terms of how to um, um, do insulin um, uh, initiation if an in-person visit isn't possible. Yeah, it's really hard. Our diabetes educator has been doing them some by over Zoom, but it just is not the same. I don't know if other faculty have had more better experience, I'm happy to hear it. Um, this is Jordana Lovre. Um, I just wanted to let you know there's a uh, long time ago we used to get the little um, demo skin uh, boxes. So if you bring it to the camera very close and you kind of use the pen to show it, it works a little bit better, I think, than trying to show on your own skin. So if somebody has um, those, or I guess you could use a fruit or anything else, it might be just easier to zoom in and show it to them. I would say that we, I give myself dry injections often to show patients that. And I think that they're always, I like it. So I took injection, I didn't scream, I didn't shout, you know, and so I think it's often very powerful for them to see how quick it is and how easy it is. Um, and, and yes, sometimes people need an additional step, but I think people need to see how quick and easy it is. And, and that first step is easy to overcome. Any other additional questions and or faculty, if you want to respond to some of the questions that um, that you answered um, during uh, Jay's presentation, go ahead. Uh, Jay, that was that was excellent. Excellent. Uh, I was just wondering if you could comment on um, on the use of the, the gliptins uh, as mealtime oral agents that uh, that it's kind of old school, but I, I know uh, then a local endocrinologist likes that, and I was wondering what your comments on it were. Yeah, uh, so I think um, when you can get the fasting glucose down, there will, will, will be medicines that will have some efficacy. Uh, so, you know, DPP-4 inhibitors, while they're relatively mild in their uh, effect, if you need to just lower them 30 or 40 points or 0.5 A1C, they might be a very nice, simple option after basal insulin. And I find that I use them probably most often in my elderly. You know, a basal insulin and a DPP-4, what a great combination and a soft treatment for our patients. So yes, I think it is a viable option. Um, I use still a carbo sometimes in patients with very high, high carb diets. I certainly use GLP-1s uh, as well. So there, there are viable non-insulin options if you can get the glucose down in the morning. And thanks for your comments. Do you want me to talk about any other the, questions? Go yeah. ahead. Yeah, please go ahead, Jay. There was a question about the combination of basal insulin and GLP-1 receptor agonists, the fixed ratio combination. These are wonderful medicines. They have very good efficacy and they're very well tolerated. Um, in my world, they're not covered very well, so it's quite hard to get them. If you have an insurance that you that will cover them, I think it's great. Um, because they do get patients down below 7% in a very reliable manner. My main challenge to that is I often want to use insulin quickly, but also take them off insulin if I can. And if you use a fixed ratio, you've kind of made a commitment to a long-term combination. Um, so very effective option. Absolutely, it works well. Um, if it's covered, great. But for many of my patients, it's not, a, not an option early on. Finally, we're going to move on um, the, the last few minutes for a submitted question. So once again, on your registration, please feel free to submit a, a question so we can answer. Um, one of them that came up uh, that we weren't able to get to last week is what should I know about the metformin extended release recall? What do my patients need to be aware, aware of? Uh, Mary, you want to go ahead and take a stab at this? Yeah, I'll be, I'll be real brief for sure. Um, so I, I'm sharing a link to the FDA's website with regards to sort of the, the press release um, regarding the metformin ER product recall. Essentially on May 28th, uh, the FDA recommended a voluntary recall of certain metformin extended release products. And then that recall was expanded a bit um, as of, I think it was June 11th. 
essentially it's not all metformin ER products that have been recalled. It's five manufacturers and it varies between one lot or a, a series of, of lots, essentially batches of product of the 500 and 750 milligram strength. Um, essentially, it is a voluntary recall. This is done out of an abundance of caution. It was due to the fact that there were certain tests performed that detected levels of that N-nitroso dimethylamine, that NDMA contaminant, uh, which is a, a known probable human carcinogen. And it was found or detected at levels above what the FDA considers to be sort of um, permissible or tolerable. We're all exposed to this NDMA contaminant. It's found in meat, it's found in dairy, it's found in, in our diet. Uh, it's very similar to what we saw with um, ranitidine, for example, or losartan. I think the important factor is we're not likely to see metformin ER disappear from the marketplace like we saw with ranitidine because there are not all batches of, or, or not all manufacturers that have been affected. Um, it's unclear why this contaminant is entering these products, whether it's something due to the manufacturing or packaging process. Um, but I think important things that we can recall or, or remind to tell our patients if we go to the next slide um, is, is really just the fact that this is done out of an abundance of caution. So we need to really be reassuring. I think certain patients hear the cancer word and they're like freaked out. So um, again, it's an abundance of caution. We've got no adverse events that are reported because of this contaminant or impurity being found. Um, it's also worth noting that the FDA is asking all metformin ER manufacturers to test products now before they enter the marketplace. So we're not likely to see recalls or, or we shouldn't see new prescriptions that have levels of NDMA above what is considered to be acceptable moving forward. Patients should be encouraged to contact product uh, pharmacies for confirmation of their products and perhaps a replacement if necessary. Uh, patients who are taking recalled metformin should continue their medicine until they have the replacement product in hand. This isn't, you know, cease using your therapy immediately kind of recommendation. And, you know, Again, we're not expecting shortages because not all metformin ER manufacturers are being affected at this time. Also for patients who are really uptight, we can consider switching them over to the immediate release formulations because metformin IR hasn't been affected by this recall um, to date. So just good things to sort of know and be aware of. Great. Thank you so much, uh, Mary. And once again, um, if you would like to submit a question, please do so. Um, on the registration. Um, and I want to uh, thank everyone for joining our session this week.